Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Suffolk University Presents Market Watch, looking ahead into the global economy. Please welcome, to begin our program, Suffolk University Professor of Economics, Jonathan Houghton. Thanks, Brian. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody, uh, to this uh, webinar. We have a, a wonderful uh, speaker lined up. Uh, I'm Jonathan Houghton. I chair the economics department. And although we are in arts and sciences, um, many of our students are in the business school. And so we, uh, we cut across some of the silos. Uh, of course, there's, a, there's an old curse um, that goes along the lines of, may you live in interesting times. And indeed, uh, we do live in interesting times. Um, and we've had to adapt. Uh, as you probably know, uh, Suffolk has gone uh, online for all of our teaching, for our meetings, for group work, for pretty much everything. And uh, students are adapting as well. Um, we have plenty of challenges. We have students in multiple time zones, for example. Uh, today I was teaching a class with a student in China, one in Paraguay, one in Haiti, one in Spain, and a few here in Boston. So um, we're adapting, and uh, these interesting times are requiring us to rethink what, uh, what's going to happen to the world in the foreseeable future. And to talk about that, we have um, Ken Torbs, who uh, got his MBA at Suffolk in, in 1984, and who has been in the investment and asset management business for, well, not quite 40 years now. Um, he uh, has worked with Pioneer Investments since 1998, and is now the chief investment officer for the US operations of um, Amundi Pioneer Asset Management. Uh, he's also a portfolio management and active in that in his own right. And uh, he is going to talk for roughly 20 minutes, uh, after which we will turn to questions and answers. Um, if you do have questions or even comments, please use the chat facility on Zoom, type in your question. We won't have time to address all of them. And indeed, we have about 30 questions that came in even before the event, but we'll do our best to sift through them and cover the, the main points. So without further ado, let me turn you over to Ken and uh, welcome to all of you. And thank you, Ken, for agreeing to, uh, to share your thoughts with us this evening. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Good evening, everyone. And uh, welcome to the uh, Suffolk University webinar. And I'm very pleased to uh, have a few minutes here to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what's been going on in the economy. And uh, most importantly, from our perspective, my perspective, how it's impacting the financial and, and capital markets and uh, what's been going on with the investment uh, arena over the last couple of weeks. And uh, it's, it's been pretty difficult for, for many people, not just uh, financially, but uh, even more importantly for their health. And uh, that's ma mainly uh, the thing we need to be focused on. And, uh, but uh, people do want to hear about what's going on in the economy and what the implications are and, and for their investment uh, portfolio. So I'll spend a few minutes on that. And uh, by and large, I'll do three things. I'll talk about what happened and how it impacted the market, what uh, various uh, arms of government are doing. And thirdly, uh, what's happened specifically in the market in 08, no, 09, uh, the last serious uh, economic downturn we had. And one of the main differences is the accelerated pace of the decline. In 08 and 09, it played out over many quarters. People didn't know if we were in a recession. Was the housing market really going to fall? Ken, I, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm so sorry. This, uh, I'm wondering if you can stop your video for the moment. I think the internet bandwidth is being choked a little bit by so many people being online at once. Um, and your, your audio is cutting out a little bit, if you wouldn't mind stopping your video just for them just for at least the time being i think we might get a better performance from your audio okay can you hear me yes we can hear you yeah, thank perfect. you so what, the, what i was saying is that the accelerated nature of the time was really quite different it, we went an economy that was actually in february of this year, some steam 
the unemployment rate was below uh, the employment tightening and, and labor was getting wage increases. And then all of a sudden the uh, crisis hit and the economy went from 60 miles an hour to zero as a car hit a brick wall. And uh, everyone knew, people in the investment area, the government officials, you could see immediately that we were going into a recession as the economy ground to a complete halt almost, except for a few critical areas. And because of that, investors reacted very, very quickly and unfortunately all at once. And there really was really a plumbing clog. It, the market did not absorb all the selling that was going on at once over the last few weeks, particularly at the end of February and on an accelerated basis through um, March. And it affected certain types of markets that you wouldn't have expected to see downturns. Even um, early on, even government guaranteed treasury bonds and mortgages uh, fell in price because the dealers and the investment community just did not have the bandwidth to handle all the selling at once. I think also a complication that has gone somewhat unnoticed is that the entire Wall Street had to move from trading desks in offices to home remote trading. And I think that took a couple of weeks to shake out as well. That seriously reduced liquidity for a period of time. But what's unlike 08 and 09 in another sense is the fact that this time the financial system is not broken. The core problem is not in the financial industry, which is what the case was last time. So even though the plumbing is clogged or was clogged, the, the, the system itself is not broken. And um, that's where I think many of the programs that you have begun to uh, see trickled out of Washington uh, have had a material impact on the markets, particularly the investment market. And hopefully in the coming month or so or weeks, uh, the real economy as well. And I might point out a couple of things about the Fed, uh, who have acted very, very swiftly this time, and quite dramatically. In fact, uh, their programs, uh, the numerous programs they put in place, have actually exceeded already what they did in uh, 08 and 09 in their ultimate scope. And I'll give you uh, two examples. For example, one is uh, the quantitative easing, the so-called purchasing of government bonds, treasury bonds, and agency mortgage securities in the secondary market uh, is not with a specified limit. At first it was 750 billion, that was their first announcement. But several weeks ago, they moved that to unlimited quantitative easing. And there, therein lies potential trillions of dollars of security purchases. In fact, in just the last few weeks, uh, the Fed has purchased probably around $1.3 trillion worth of bonds, a trillion dollars worth of government bonds, treasuries, and probably another 300 billion plus of government guaranteed mortgages from Ginnie Mae, Fannie Mae, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, so this clearly will exceed what they did during the 0809 crisis. The second thing uh, they've done is they've unleashed a whole host of programs uh, with an alphabet soup of, 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 of uh, initials that are targeted to various aspects of the market. By my count, um, there's about six of them. And uh, these six programs will target um, supporting money market mutual funds, the issuance of commercial paper in the market. Uh, and, and where they've gone beyond the last crisis is uh, two new programs, a primary corporate credit facility and a secondary corporate credit facility will actually enable the Fed to purchase through uh, special uh, purpose vehicles, corporate bonds in the secondary market and uh, allow for issuance in primary markets. Even going as far as buying uh, corporate ETFs um, that have a certain predefined maturity, this goes well beyond uh, what they did in 08 and 09. And uh, I think the market has begun to function much better since they began implementing uh, many of these programs, including uh, the quantitative easing. And some of them are really just getting going or have not even got going yet. So there's more to come here, uh, particularly with some of the asset back programs that they did in the last crisis as well. So I think uh, the Fed has been extraordinarily swift in their actions 
and frankly, uh, very material in what they're doing going beyond what they did. Uh, the second big piece of, um, of uh, really uh, fiscal stimulus, and they're not really calling it stimulus, they're calling it the CARES Act really to, to really, I think, uh, cushion the downside on the economy, the so-called CARES Act passed by Congress, also extraordinarily swiftly. Um, and I want to point out a few things about this while I mention a couple of, I think, interesting facts that may affect uh, various people uh, or people you know. Um, first off, it's hard to say exactly how much this legislation is because uh, it depends on the take up on uh, the loans and the guarantees and we don't know quite yet, but it could potentially be 2.2 to 2.6 trillion dollars worth of government uh, intervention in the economy of support. And uh, le let me put that in perspective. This is probably the largest dollar value, even in today's dollars, of legislation ever passed by Congress, even bigger than the FDR's New Deal, uh, I, I've read. And furthermore, in context of the last recession, the 08-09 um, period, when Congress and uh, the President Obama passed legislation uh, the Recovery Act, that was not quite five point, not quite six percent of GDP. This legislation, if you think about GDP prior to um, the recession at year end, it was probably running around twenty one trillion dollars, the U.S. GDP. So this is somewhere between eleven and twelve percent of U.S. GDP, which is quite large, uh, and much of it. A lot of it is direct support and payments, not just loan guarantees. So this is more than double the effort on um, supporting the economy than the last recession. So both of these pieces of legislation, coupled with the two smaller pieces they've done earlier, and now there's even talk of a fourth one, we'll, we'll see. And I, I might make a few points about this legislation before moving on to the markets. Um, there, there are really four main elements. One of them is payment to individuals, which is just under $600 billion. Uh, there are tax cuts and grants to various businesses, uh, small, medium alike. Uh, there's also a half a trillion of loans to businesses and um, another 460 or $70 billion of government spending to the states, which is about 340 billion and other entities. If you add it all up, somewhere between 2.2 and 2.6 billion a trillion dollars. I just a few highlights on the legislation that affects uh, individuals. Uh, I'm sure you've read about uh, the direct checks that people are going to get if you uh, have certain income levels. Uh, the full amount, 1,200 per individual. If your income is 75,000 or lower, it phases out up to uh, I think 99,000. Double that uh, for couples. Uh, and some payment of 500 for, for ch children under 16. Um, I think that will take a few weeks. Uh, apparently, if you have uh, files by uh, electronically, you get it much quicker than uh, if you don't have a, a direct deposit with the Treasury. I think the other important element is the unemployment benefits. And this one is very interesting in some respects because um, what it does is in addition to extending unemployment benefits by 13 weeks uh, from whatever your state uh, policy is, in Massachusetts, for example, it's, it's maximum of 26, it would go to 39. But uh, if you think about unemployment benefits, historically they've paid about 45, not quite 50% of the US median income. So the median income has been running about $940, $950. So if you think about it, your unemployment um, benefits would be on average $450 to $500. Some states are lower, some states are higher. But this particular legislation adds $600 to whatever your state benefit would be. And interestingly enough, in 34 of, of the 50 states, that extra $600 puts the unemployment benefit higher than the average weekly earnings in those states, which is, means that on average, it replaces almost you know, 100% of that person's income. And uh, so if you think it'll be about $1,000 a week, uh, if you do the math, and that 
will mean half the recipients, the median, uh, will get almost 100% of their income replaced during the period of unemployment. Some economists think it has some perverse, um, uh, perverse um, behaviors in that because it may be more profitable for some people to not work uh, in some states. And uh, there is a provision that in this legislation that you can quit and still collect unemployment if you can certify that you have um, been affected by COVID-19, uh, for example, childcare, for example. But anyways, this is gonna go a long way, uh, at least for the next several months in uh, supporting, I think, uh, the basic necessities of food, rent, shelter, that kind of thing, because it replaces a large portion of, of people's average weekly earnings. Uh, obviously, it's not meant to pay for trips and large discretionary payments. Uh, because we're on a call with uh, a, a university, you may be interested in know, knowing that payments on student loans uh, held by the Department of Education uh, are, uh, are um, for 60 days, uh, don't have to be uh, paid, and up to 180 days forbearance. So, uh, so that's for, for, for interest and, uh, and fees. So uh, you'll have some, some uh, deferment of uh, student loan payments. Um, furthermore, uh, on, on mortgages, um, there is some forbearance that it, for any government-backed mortgage, um, it'll be uh, impermissible to uh, foreclose on someone for 60 days and uh, 180 days of forbearance if you can demonstrate your financial hardship is caused by COVID-19. Uh, there's some other interesting things. You can withdraw money from your R R IRA without penalty for the rest of the year, up to $100,000. Uh, for those that run small businesses, there's also, um, of 500 or fewer uh, employees, with 500 or fewer employees, there are provisions that for forgivable loans, at least part of the loans could be forgivable, if, uh, and the loans are up to two and a half times your average weekly payroll, up to $10 million, if you um, can um, demonstrate that you've maintained a certain amount of employment and the loans have gone to paying uh, compensation, benefits, rent, um, all interest, things like that. So we'll see how much of that gets taken up. So there's quite a bit in there. Uh, obviously, there's a bailout for some big businesses, including airlines, uh, cargo planes, uh, national security, which means Boeing, um, and, and some other uh, goodies. But it adds up to quite a bit. Uh, so that that's really um, what's gone on. And Washington has moved at an extraordinary pace. And now they're talking about an additional uh, piece of legislation uh, that um, I think will be far more difficult to uh, negotiate um, as they're starting to talk about things that uh, were changed in the tax laws and, and everybody wants their, uh, their goodies. But uh, we'll see how that progresses. Now let's just turn for the last few minutes about the markets. And uh, I, I must say that um, one, one uh, unfortunate aspect of what's happened is that the decline in the equity markets between February 19th and March 23rd uh, represented the fastest decline in equity markets um, in, in really modern history, uh, even worse than the depression. Uh, the market was down 34% in, in really just over a, a month. And, and that was quite extraordinary. And as many of you know, uh, there are quite severe losses in the equity markets um, still year to date. Um, in fact, uh, almost last night, not including today, sm small positive uh, gains, 27% down in the Dow, 23% in the S&P, and 18% down in the NASDAQ, which means by and large, uh, large cap growth companies, big, uh, big cap uh, Apple and a lot of the internet stocks have held up much better than the traditional Dow stocks like banks and industrials and some of the more cyclical parts of the economy have done far worse, as you can imagine. Um, the only saving grace is, um, is we've done better than Europe, which has been down 30, 32%. And I might add that once again, um, Europe has been very slow. The ECB um, finally came to the table, but after some weeks of dithering in my view, and now uh, on the fiscal side, there are some um, individual country um, programs, but uh, a, a 
broad range European program is, is uh, still being worked on, if at all. And uh, the market has uh, not appreciated that so far. One, one of the um, more difficult, difficult aspects of the markets this time has been the bond market. And you know, many people have asset allocations that include bonds to uh, cushion the downside when we have poor equity markets or volatile equity markets, which can be expected. But what people don't always expect is volatility out of their bond market portfolio. And it's been really quite severe, the downfall in some parts of the bond market um, this year and during the last month. And I'll give you some ideas about that. Um, if you look at um, some sectors, the treasury market, which is you know, full faith and credit of the US government, uh, the, the average treasury bond is up about 9% year to date. And, um, and that's on average. So you have 10 year maturities up 13%, 30 years up 28 and five years up seven, average is around nine. But um, you would think investment grade corporates, which is by and large all, you know, the top US companies, all investment grade. Uh, if you look at that market year to date, they're actually minus 4%. So those bonds have not held up very well and have also contributed to negative returns. And if you look at a comparable maturity investment grade corporate to a treasury, the right kind of treasury, the comparable treasury, uh, the 10 year treasury, as I said, is up 13 corporates, which have on average the same sort of maturity are down for. So they've underperformed comparable treasuries by 17%. That's really quite extraordinary, actually. And uh, the yields now are quite high on investment grade corporates compared to uh, government bonds. And I may give you some information there. Um, the other areas of the market that have been very weak have been, the, as you would expect, the high yield bond market, the so-called junk bond market. So far, year to date is down 14%. And another area where people expect to uh, have positive results in this environment. The municipal bond market has also struggled a lot, and a lot over the last few days, particularly, uh, and year to date now, that market's also negative, uh, negative 3%, and that market should be up more like a 10-year treasury. So another 16, 17% underperformance versus government bonds, which is also quite extraordinary. And of course, the reason that corporate bonds and munis and junk bonds particularly are underperforming is that we're in a deep recession and we are in a deep recession and uh, it's going to continue for a couple more months i believe um, if you look at some of the unemployment claim numbers that come out every week uh, last week there are over three million of new um, insurance claims and this week it was over six million uh, keep in mind there's about 150 million americans before the recession employed a little bit over that so every million and a half drop um, filing on claims could represent about a 1% increase in the unemployment rate. And we've already seen 9 million new claims. Keep in mind, unemployment claims have been running 300,000 a week. Now, this week it was 6 million. So we've probably already uh, seen a jump of at least six points in the unemployment rate over the last two weeks. And it was already three and a half, three six. So I suspect the unemployment rate is very soon going to be 10%, and it may hit as high as 15%, at least on a short term basis, we hope. And that's why I think these other bond markets, which are credit sensitive, not guaranteed by the government, have seen some weak, um, some weak uh, pricing. That said, uh, a lot of these government programs are going to support a lot of the downside. And I think that there are lots of different opportunities now in some of these markets uh, that look pretty interesting. So I'll stop there and um, we'll see what kind of questions uh, we have. Maybe while we're getting the questions, I might just say that post-World War II, there's been 10 bear markets and, uh, and defined by 20% or more decline. And the average uh, peak to recovery has historically been just under four years. And the median has been under three years. So if you're really uh, nervous about retiring or, or depressed about it, I, I think history is on our side that uh, in, in three to four years, if we can get through this in the next couple of months, that the equity markets will respond to a, a better economy and we'll see a recovery. So I'll stop there. 
Thank you very much, Ken. That gives us a tremendous amount to think about. Uh, let me uh, raise a few, some of the questions that have uh, flowed in and indeed continue to flow in. One is that uh, the, the, a number of questions relate to the real estate sector and are wondering what, what effects uh, can we expect to see uh, here on out in the real estate sector? And uh, if you want to invest in that sector, should you wait or is this a good moment to plunge in? Uh, keep in mind, um, I'm not allowed to give investment advice. I'm not like, I'm an investment Fine. advice. To be sure. Yeah, yeah. But I tell you about the real estate market. Um, I uh, will say this, that uh, the real estate market today, and I'll start by saying the residential real estate market, is very different in this cycle than it was in 08 and 09. Um, first off, there's far less um, leverage in that sector of the market on the part of investors. And the borrowers have been much more conservative. Um, post the, um, the 08, 09 uh, collapse, which was centered in the financial sector and particularly the mortgage sector, uh, there were multitude of rule changes that required much safer, much sounder underwriting, uh, proof of documentation of income, uh, much better um, uh, estimates of the value, appraisals, independent appraisals, uh, much more uh, money down on many loans. Uh, so the home equity value, the underwriting is much sounder. And I think that uh, with the appreciation we've seen in housing over the last, uh, decade uh, now exceeding in most parts of the U.S. the prior peak, most homeowners have uh, a fair amount of equity in their home on average and uh, will not allow that to dissipate. So I do not think that uh, there's going to be a lot of pressure um, on, on selling uh, and the quality of the mortgages are much better. And uh, I think that uh, if going into this um, downturn, the consumer uh, most of us on average, not everybody, of course, but on average, the consumer was in much stronger position than they were in 06 and 07. Uh, in 06 and 07, the savings rate was negative. Uh, at the end of this year, uh, or in the third quarter when the data was out, it was almost 8% positive. Um, and the consumer has spent the last decade deleveraging and their debt servicing had reached very, very strong coverage ratios. So I think there's a lot of ability uh, to pay. I think there's a lot of um, home equity value. And I think there is very little inventory overhang and there hasn't been as much overbuilding. In fact, there's been a shortage of residential housing over the last two or three years. So I don't think this market is anything near uh, what it was. And in prior recessions, not the last one, of course, uh, often the housing market just go sideways uh, in terms of pricing. So um, that would be my expectation in, in this time. Commercial real estate's interesting because uh, I've been wondering that myself because, boy, is it, people have begun to prove that they can work from home. Whole companies, including ours, is, is working from home relatively successfully. It doesn't mean it's all for the good. But I just wonder if people will continue to think they need as much commercial real estate as they have in the past. I don't know how that, that'll shake out, but I think the residential market looks much sounder than it did last time. That, um, well, the next set of questions that we're getting are on some of the macro effects. Um, given the very large injection of liquidity, um, are we going to, is there a risk of inflation sometime down the line or as one person put it are we doomed to suffer through a prolonged deflationary cycle well you know i guess you know i came from the more the milton friedman school of economics where you know you know inflation's about monetary policy and uh to date it hasn't really occurred even during the last cycle uh when we had quantitative easing and um, I, I don't know if that proves the point, but um, one thing's for sure, there was a lot of debate about this uh, modern monetary theory where fiscal deficits don't matter. And I don't think we had much of a deb debate about it, but here we are, we're, we're experimenting with it. So I don't think anybody knows really the outcomes of what's gonna happen here. 
if you look at certain indicators of inflation, so far uh, they haven't really gone off the charts. Uh, you know, if you look at in the government bond market, there are so-called uh, treasury inflation protected securities, TIPS as they're called. Um, and frankly, they've underperformed nominal treasuries. In other words, uh, so far in this cycle, inflation expectations have fallen, not risen. Uh, so I, I would say that the market is not worried about it yet, but inflation can be a very long, a long uh, path to, to occur. And uh, we just don't know. And, uh, and um, frankly, I don't think anybody really knows. And uh, you, know, you can look back at some of the reasons why we didn't have a lot of inflation over the last few years. And I wonder if some of those reasons are in fact uh, dissipating. Um, you, you know, We had from the 70s onward until the last few years, uh, trade as a percentage of world GDP had increased quite nicely for 30 plus years until recently where it flattened out, even gone down as trade wars and tariffs and, and restrictions come about. And I think that had a very positive disinflationary effect. You know, the comparative advantage factors, even if it has negative microeconomic consequences in certain parts of a country or a region, it has good macroeconomic benefits. Furthermore, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, emergence out of their really emerging market state uh, where they basically had government policy to build all sorts of industrial manufacturing capacity, whether the world needed the plants or not, caused a dramatic global supply, oversupply in many industrial areas. And, um, you know, the central banks from or the early 80s until the last crisis were fighting uh, uh, inflation and held real rates very, very high. And now real rates have been since 08, 09, negative real rates and even worse in Europe, negative nominal rates. So I just wonder, you know, may, I don't think this year or next year, but I wouldn't rule it out over the next 10 or 15 years that we can be in a, in a, in a more inflationary environment as possible. That actually raises the interesting question of uh, to what extent are we likely to pull back from the open borders model um, and to try, in a sense, to rely more on domestic production, particularly on some things like medical supplies and, and consumer staples and maybe other things that are likely to be deemed essential or important for national security in the future. And if that's the case, will they, um, if we have borders that are less open, um, what other implications might there be that uh, we could foresee already? Well, I, I, I tend to uh, think that's quite possible. Uh, we were already seeing that because of not this uh, particular uh, virus, but because of populism and, and the negative consequences, what I said, the microeconomic consequences of, of, of free trade and the cumulative effects. I mean, obviously, I mean, if, if you uh, have a shirt made in China or somewhere else, you save two or three bucks or five bucks, uh, but you know it has a devastating effect on the plant that get closed down in, 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 in the South, or same thing with autos. Uh, and I think the rise of populism and the current uh, administration uh, is evidence of that. And it wasn't just here either, by the way. But now on top of that, you have the virus and it's showing uh, the consequences of off offshoring everything. And even in this crisis, you've seen so some countries, I think, act in a knee-jerk way to shut exports down. There were, there were reports of, for example, uh, Kazakhstan, which is um, one of the biggest uh, exporters of grains, shutting all its exports, even though they grow more grain than they can possibly consume. Uh, and so I think that's possible. I, I think that um, you may see more domestic supply chains, which may have the impact of raising costs, which may have the impact of reducing potential GDP, I suspect. Yeah. Um, Ken Kenneth Mooney has a question, which is along the lines of how do you see supply chains uh, changing in the future? But more specifically, he's wondering, will the economic crisis forever change us to a digital society? I, I think it's inevitable. Um, I think it's going to accelerate it. I mean, 
if you can prove you can run your entire company, like we have 500 people for weeks and not months on end, I, I think that's going to change a lot of uh, what people do and how they think about work, whether it reduces travel more permanently for business or other types of uh, business activities that could be now done this way or work from home. Like it may work out in terms of more flexible work. It may have some positive aspects as well, not just negative. I, I just think we, we're only beginning to see the consequences. Yes, yes. Well, one of the other sectors that a number of people have mentioned in their questions is the uh, oil sector. Um, have low oil prices or, let's say, volatility in the oil sector uh, played a significant role? And how do you see that uh, playing out in the, in the medium term? Well, prior to the... Uh last decade or more when we've had the extraordinary uh, boom in oil production from fracking in our shell basins like the Permian Basin and the Bakken and these other large basins uh, where we've become now uh, you know almost self-sufficient in energy production. Um, before that when we were almost importing most of our energy consumption it was an unmitigated positive when energy prices dropped. <laughs> Uh, because we were basically not producing it, but consuming, consuming it. I mean, that's an exaggeration, but it was so far in, in, in the balance on consumption, not production. And, uh, you know, everybody buys energy for driving and heating and whatever else they do with it. And uh, the pr price drop used to be considered like a big tax cut. But now it's not as clear cut because there's so much investment in the energy sector in the United States. And many of those jobs, even if they're, it's relatively small, several million uh, relative to the whole, the whole, they're generally very high paying jobs. And um, that will have a negative consequence on um, certain regions of the country, which had heretofore been very strong, like Texas and Wyoming and the Dakotas. Um, and, um, it will result in, I believe, a fair amount of bankruptcies among some of the smaller shell and energy producers. In fact, there was one today called Whiting Petroleum. And uh, most of those companies are what we call junk credits, you know, below investment grade. But, um, and, and most of those bond prices are already reflected in the market, frankly, in their stocks. So I don't think it has much more downside in terms of the market, but it has real economic consequences. Uh, and this time, because we're not driving, uh, people are stuck home for the most part. We're also not getting the full benefit of the energy cut so far. So I, I would say uh, on, on balance, this is also contributing uh, to the downside in the markets particularly, uh, but also the economy. A um, couple of, uh, in, in a question from Vincent Laporte, he asks, how concerned are you of fallen angels or the buildup of companies on the border between investment grade and below investment grade? Um, and he's concerned that uh, maturity walls may be coming due and uh, this could lead to some significant disruption. Yeah, I, I think that always happens. Um, in uh, when you have a crisis, people begin to worry about that. I remember people talking about that in 08 and 09, the gigantic refinancing wall for high yield companies. And in the end, if the economy rebounds uh, and the markets uh, reflect that rebound, the refinancings will get done. Um, there are, in this cycle, I, I think quite a few investment grade companies that um, had been more willing to run their businesses at the lower spectrum of uh, the investment grade credit market. In fact, one of the, if you look at the investment grade credit index, um, the fastest growing cohort in there had been the triple Bs, which is the lowest rating within investment grade. And uh, so the average credit quality of that index has fallen. So if this gets prolonged for, you know, months and months or, you know, goes into quarters and quarters, it becomes more serious. Uh, but right now, one thing that has happened, which is interesting, um, initially I said, you know, the plumbing was clogged, but in the last two weeks, we've had record issuance of new investment grade corporate debt. In fact, last week it was over 200 billion 
there's been over 100 issues globally, I believe, of new issuance. So the new issuance market is up and running again, which is a very good sign in my view. Uh, and even this week, there have been two um, issues uh, from the high yield space. One, one is from a high yield company, um, Yum Brands, which many of you know is you know a re, you know a, a global uh, food uh, you know I don't want to say junk food, but you know KFC and things like that. And also Carnival Cruises, believe it or not, which was previously investment grade. Even they were able to raise in the market, I believe six and a half billion dollars of financing today and yesterday, six billion of bonds and convertibles and a half a billion of equity. So the markets are not dead. And uh, if we see that over the coming months, that, that'll enable things to get refinanced. Also, um, some of the issuance we've seen over the last two weeks has been to what we call term out commercial paper and short maturities, where you've seen some big US companies uh, issue longer term bonds, 10, even 30 year debt uh, and repl you know, replacing uh, short term maturity. So getting by that refinancing wall, as you call it. Uh, but it's something to watch if the economy grinds down for a very long time. Yeah. Um, one, um, one of our listeners uh, raises a concern about the repo market, which um, has required a, a fair amount of support from the Fed uh, to prevent it from melting down. Is that a particularly vulnerable part of the system? Uh, I think we're kind of past that myself. Um, in fact, the Fed expanded its repo uh, program. I, I, I can't remember early this week or late last week uh, for other central banks uh, who hold many of their reserves and treasuries and as their currencies uh, weaken and as investors withdraw investments in their countries, they need to uh, support uh, their, those payments. And uh, they were having to sell treasuries, but now the Fed uh, did a few things. You know, they uh, increased uh, swap line, currency swaps first with uh, some of the big uh, developed countries. And, and then they broadened that out and now they extended it to anybody that has a Fed account uh, repos. So other central banks have access um, to the repo market. Furthermore, uh, the various programs the Fed put in place, the quantitative, and remember, they bought a trillion dollars of treasuries already. So there's a lot less that needs to be financed uh, in general. And um, I think that it's unlimited. So I, I just tend to think that we're beyond that part, to be honest. Do you think that um, we're going to see negative interest rates? Well, we have seen negative T-bill rates already. Um, in fact, T-bill rates had been negative for a while. Uh, for the last couple of weeks, as there's been such demand for that collateral. Um, the Fed, though, has said they're not going to engineer negative rates like they did in Europe. Um, I, I, I think that that has proven to be less um, of, of, of a clear-cut positive than um, particularly on a long-dated basis. The longer it went on, I think the less clear it became as a positive. So I don't think they really want to do that. And uh, the market forced the bill rate negative, uh, but uh, more recently that turned positive. So uh, I don't think the Fed's going to engineer it, no. I think they'll rely on more asset purchases. Um, a couple of people are sort of wondering whether in fact the COVID-19 episode uh, will or should affect long-term investing, uh, if at all. Do you see possible trends, people recalibrating how they think about the long term? I, I think that uh, whenever you have a crisis, people reevaluate what they've been doing and how they invest. I, I think that uh, this will be no different. I think first, you know, the first part of this downturn has been about raising liquidity, getting liquidity. Uh, you know, people see that they're going to get laid off or businesses see that their revenue is going to go down. So they draw down their revolvers. They do all sorts of things. They sell investments. They do all sorts of things to raise cash. And that's what you saw in the first three or four weeks. The Fed stepped in. I think they've taken care of a lot of that. 
But now what's happening in the market, in my view, is more the longer term thinking. Who are the winners going to be? Who are the losers going to be? And triaging and making um, discerning investment choices. And the market so far has continued to think that, you know, the large cap tech companies are going to be winners here. I mean, think about, um, you know, what you're doing at home and, and what it requires, what kind of companies supply that uh, so you can work from home or do things or if you're not traveling. So I think that there's going to be lots of uh, opportunities because of this and also areas of less investment for sure. We just have a few uh, more minutes left and, and let me turn to some of the broader, almost philosophical questions that uh, listeners have sent in. Um, one goes, as a result of government intervention to quell the spread of the coronavirus, which societal changes will be long term? Another says, will life ever return to normal? And a third says, if we for short of food at some point, uh, people are going to take out their guns and we are going to see an uptick in violence. Are you worried about these prognostications or uh, is this within a much more manageable um, scope? I hope not, uh, frankly. Um, but we've had pandemics, not in modern times, but in the past. And often we recover pretty quickly from these things. Um, and we'll see what happens because the more people that get it, the more immunity there is in society. So uh, we'll, we'll see how long it takes. Um, and we're, by the way, we're supposed to see some results from some companies in a couple of days, if not weeks, if not days, on how some of their trials are going um, on some of the drugs like uh, Gilead Sciences and, and others. Uh, so that would certainly help if it has some positive impact. Um, the, the food issue, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not a, 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 a expert in this area, but frankly, what I've read is that there's plenty of food. It's a matter of distribution and logistics. Uh, and uh, so far, so good on that. But uh, I don't know how that will work out if uh, this goes on for months or quarters after quarter, you can't do anything. Um, there are stories on Bloomberg and elsewhere about, you know, what happens if the workers, the farmers get uh, and you can't get the crops in. So I think you can spin a lot of negative stuff. But uh, one thing you can see already is in China, where I might add they've had a more um, mandatory lockdown, not, not just uh, appealing to our goodwill, but mandatory dramatic lockdowns. Uh, the incidence of new cases is extraordinarily low. Uh, the testing now identifies and quarantines people pretty quickly, and they are getting back to some semblance of uh, normality, not all at once, but uh, even I've heard from uh, some of my colleagues who are Chinese and have family there, they've even opened up some um, of the restaurants again, uh, with, with not as densely packed as they used to be, but so they are getting back to normal. So even in Europe, uh, we're beginning to see uh, a flattening of the new cases every day, uh, not a drop yet, but uh, you need a flattening first. So we're a few weeks behind that. So. If we continue to make progress there, I'm hoping the worst case scenarios you described don't come to fruition. Well, that, um, that more or less brings us to the end of the time we have allocated. But Ken, thank you ever so much. You covered an enormous amount of ground in a very efficient 45 minutes. And uh, there's something for everyone there. Um, we weren't able to answer uh, or pose all of the questions here, but I think one way or the other, we probably touched on almost uh, everything that uh, was raised at some level or other. And um, it's uh, nice to end on a, a note that's at least cautiously optimistic. And uh, I think we're all um, not just hoping, but we changed our lives in the expectation that it is going to begin to make a difference. And that in within um, a few months, we hope to follow what uh, China has been able to do and get back to a new normal that won't be quite the old normal, but won't be like today. So again, thank you, Ken. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And uh, this will be recorded. It will be available online. And uh, 
So if you want to hear it again or share it with others, uh, that uh, is something we hope that uh, you will do. And thank you again. Yep, good night now. Nice.